In this session, uh, we are going to be talking about the uh, interactions between Christianity uh, and the Civil War. It's important to state up front that just like the Revolutionary War, the Civil War was a political event. There were a lot of political foundations, uh, drivers that established and, and moved the Civil War along. Unlike with the Revolutionary War, though, religion was more intertwined, Christianity was more intertwined with the Civil War in its origins, in the ways in which uh, people thought about the Civil War, talked about the Civil War, um, and so it was much more involved and tied up with the road to the Civil War than the Revolutionary War was. Um, that doesn't suggest that it was the that we we need to understand the Civil War through Christianity, uh, but it's a very important development uh, in uh, the Civil War uh, and in American history. And so, uh, what I want to do in this session is think through some of the uh, religious uh, foundations, the way religion, particularly Christianity, was tied up in the foundation for the Civil War. Uh, talk about the way the Christians uh, or the way Christianity was tied up you know, in the lives of people as they lived through the Civil War. And then I want to talk about the ways in which uh, Christianity got tied up with some of the things in the aftermath of the Civil War. So very much intertwined here uh, with the, the, the era before, during, and after. It's important to remind ourselves of some things uh, about Christianity uh, in the period before the Civil War, antebellum or before the war. What was religion like? Well, one of the things that is an important uh, hallmark of uh, Christianity uh, in the Civil War period uh, is its intertwining with um, ideas about reform. Um, in many respects, as we talked about with the Second Great Awakening, Christianity, Christians at this time, um, heavily emphasized the importance of making reforms in society that were connected with Christianity. Two of the biggest uh, were trying to decrease the amount of alcohol, eliminate prostitution, uh, there were other reform movements that we talked about as well during this time. So uh, a very important marker of Christianity in the antebellum period was reform. And of course, abolitionism, wanting to get rid of slavery, was one aspect of that for some people. Christianity was also very tied up with politics uh, at the time. Uh, that people, politicians, um, spoke often with uh, religious language, sometimes quoting scripture, were very much uh, intertwining uh, Christianity and politics, and often engaged in political endeavors that, although Christianity wasn't you know, the established religion of the United States uh, by law, um, were driven from Christian perspectives. They were you know, developing Christian legal standards. So, for example, uh, laws against blasphemy, uh, laws that prohibited what could uh, be done and what couldn't be done on Sundays. So, you know, Christianity and politics were, politics were intertwined. Uh, it was in this antebellum period that, that the United States has been the closest to being a Christian nation. Uh, as it has ever been, uh, as far as like the, the ways in which Christianity and politics were intertwined. And some of that was also reflected in uh, the ideas of Manifest Destiny. Now, Manifest Destiny was tied up with uh, the ideas of pushing for westward expansion. Right? The United States pushing towards the uh, the Pacific Ocean. Now, prior to the war with Mexico in the 1840s, 
churches have largely been divided about Western expansion. Um, many of them were for, you know, march to the sea. Uh, others, uh, you know, weren't. And of course, you know, tied up with this is the um, the place that Native Americans had in this, as Native Americans kept getting pushed further and further west. Um, after the war with Mexico, though, nearly all were supportive in this expansion, the removal of Native Americans, uh, you know, further and further from their native lands. Uh, and Manifest Destiny was tied up with Protestantism in the United States. Right? The, the, the country had this religious duty, this religious responsibility to spread its influence, uh, not only uh, westward for political gain, uh, but spreading Christianity with it, spreading civilization as they saw it, and to, you know, deny this manifest destiny for some people was pretty much treason. And so, along with this were, were ideas about establishing the kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom of God, right, this great period of peace and prosperity. And so, throughout the 20s, through the 40s, uh, the 1800s, uh, the federal government is moving native peoples uh, beyond the Mississippi to places that were known as Indian Territory, uh, which would today be Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, um, you know, the Trail of Tears uh, is, is tied up with this, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, five civilized tribes, as they were called, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, uh, were removed, uh, some of which you know, there would be some um, natives that were still here. For example, there is a Seminole tribe in Florida and a Seminole tribe in Oklahoma. Uh, the Creek, there's there's groups of the Creek uh, present, for example, in Alabama. Uh, and then the Creek uh, have also been known as Muskogee and Oklahoma. So, uh, you know, there's, there's similar types of things with some of these other tribes as well, where there's some, uh, still some present, presence in their native lands of native peoples, uh, although, you know, certainly not having the same kind of, of presence and control. But a lot of this push was tied up with uh, Christian ideas of civilization, uh, the kingdom of God. You know, and then also tied up with this was slavery. You know, does slavery move into these lands? And that's more from a political standpoint, um, you know, tied up with um you know, ideas about the uh, uh, the Civil War. Of course, it was also uh, a great time of revivalism. Revivalism continuing into the uh, 30s and 40s. So very emotional, very, uh, you know, kind of connected with um, appealing to the emotions, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, commitment to high extents, so kind of a Christianization that is uh, taking place here. As we think about some of the developments that are taking place um, during this time, I want to talk a little bit about some ways uh, Christianity is tied into uh, the religious uh, expression of the Old South. <clears throat> the Old South here course we are talking about predominantly uh, those states that went with the Confederacy um, and you know some of those states especially those on the border like if you're looking at this map right the darker uh, states are free states uh, the lighter states are uh, slave states but some of those border states Missouri uh, uh, Maryland uh, Kentucky uh, did not go with the South uh, because they were border states. They had a higher presence of uh, governmental forces, but they were slave states. So what's going on with uh, the slave states, uh, the Old South? Well, as we've mentioned before, in the 18th century, this was a region that had been uh, largely Anglican, the Church of England. 
that evangelicals um, had some success in converting people, Baptist, Methodist, but not until the 19th century do you see a large expansion of the Baptists and the Methodists in the Old South. Some of that has to do with some changes that are undergoing in evangelicalism at the time. Evangelicalism, as we mentioned before, had preached more of a message of equality in the 18th century, but gradually that a transition takes place where evangelicals in the South are more open to the status quo and are less vocal about a uh, equality between races and even between genders and more open to the status quo, more open, more vocal supporting slavery. Um, and so a lot of the South is undergoing a religious uh, conversion to being Baptists, Methodists, uh, some Presbyterians as well. And so the rise of evangelicalism uh, was a very important change that takes place here. Uh, and evangelicals are changing as well in that they're becoming in, in, you know, kind of ensconced in the status quo. We mentioned in a previous uh, lesson about the uh, controversies that are taking place uh, over slavery. Now, largely in the South, there is not much controversy over slavery. Um, but um, between North and South, uh, there are these controversies that are having an effect. We talked about previously uh, the splits that take place between denominations over slavery uh, as northerners are, uh, many northerners uh, in these denominations are believing that slavery is incompatible with Christianity, slave holding is incompatible with uh, Christianity. Uh, and then also, you know, the greater efforts that are taking place to justify slavery uh, through appeal to uh, Christian scriptures. A third development that is taking place in the South that is moving uh, the South towards uh, civil war are the ways in which Christianity is tying up, is intertwining with ideas about a separate Southern nation. Now again, a lot of the ideas pushing towards a separate Southern nation are political. But Christianity is intertwined with this. So much so that in many ways, the ways in which people talked about the separate southern nation, they are understanding as religiously oriented. They are believing the North to be moving away from God. They are believing the North to be less religiously uh, committed, more religiously liberal, and so this is not just a political stance to uphold the southern way of life it is also about upholding the christian way of life in their minds so it's not just a political event it's a religious event as well a second way that christianity was tied up with uh, the ideas of a separate southern nation was the way in which the arguments that were made for secession, the arguments made for seceding from the Union, very much mirror those arguments that led to the splits between the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Baptists. So that as politicians are arguing for a separate Southern nation, they're using the similar types of arguments that people made for you know, the Methodist Episcopal Church South. The, the Southern Baptists. So again, this intertwining that takes place. And finally, uh, a third component that is tied up here um, is that a lot of the support for secession, for a breakdown of the Union, came from clergy members. The people that are preaching in the pulpits, that are reaching the common people in the South, are the clergy. Um, they are the ones that are vocally supporting disunion. Now, certainly, there are a lot of politicians. I mean, you know, they're not the only ones. The clergy are, are following the politicians on this. Um, 
but the clergy are uh, very active in uh, putting forth arguments and justification and condemnation um, of the North, justification of Southern separatism. And so Christianity is very much tied up with this idea of a separate Southern nation that is, is pushing towards civil war. Uh, another area where Christianity is tied up with uh, origins of the Civil War uh, are the ways in which people in the North are expressing their outrage over slavery. That abolitionists, for example, that are using language to justify uh, the end of slavery uh, are doing so from uh, religious perspectives. They are making moral arguments based off of Christian uh, principles, Christian ideology, theology, um, to attempt to uh, convince the nation to get rid of slavery, to, that it's not right to uh, hold people in bondage. Now, that's not entirely the case. There were some abolitionists, like William Lloyd Garrison, who believed that Christianity wasn't um, sufficient for abolition, that Christianity was too tied up in the status quo um, and that it wasn't radical enough for abolition. Um, you know, and, and this was one of the, the complex things about Christianity and the question of um, slavery. You know, we, we take it as a given in our contemporary society that Christianity is against slavery. And I would, I would agree with that. And so there are a lot of people that are uh, active from a Christian standpoint today to end a variety of slavery that still exists globally. But in the antebellum period, because of how clearly slavery is not forcefully condemned, right? there are no passages forcefully condemning slavery in the New Testament. Now there are passages about equality and, and some other ideas that I think provide a philosophical and a theological foundation to be anti-slavery. But for a lot of uh, Protestants in the antebellum period who are looking at Scripture very straightforwardly, there aren't those passages that you can, you know, thou shalt not have slaves, right? You can't appeal to a passage like that. And so Garrison and others just felt like Christianity and Scripture didn't have the sufficient weight. And so, you know, Garrison wasn't uh, completely uh, on board uh, with this, uh, and he also had problems with the, the Constitution as well. Uh, on July uh, 4th, uh, 1854, um, he lit the fugitive slave law that we'll talk about um, in a little bit. On fire, he burned the Constitution at another anti-slavery uh, rally. Um, so he is kind of, you know, he's one of these people who is outraged against slavery, but feels like both Christianity and um, the founding documents of the country are not sufficient in this push, but they're still he's still making religious arguments. So when he burns the Constitution, you know he says, "And let the people say Amen." Right? And, you know, there's still that kind of religiosity. He, it wasn't that Garrison was an atheist; it was just you know a rejection of the sufficiency of Christianity. Although other Christians uh, believed that Scripture was very much abolition-minded. Uh, abolition a third component tying in here from a Christian standpoint, bringing about the, uh, the idea of um, moving towards the Civil War is Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was written by uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Stowe was uh, the daughter of Lyman Bre Beecher, Lyman Beecher, uh, who we uh, talked about during the Second Great Awakening. 
very prominent, well-known. Um, her family, including her father, brother, um, husband, uh, and others, <coughs> one of her sisters, and of course, uh, Beecher Stowe herself, uh, was very anti-slavery, uh, very active in pushing for an end of slavery. She wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin in uh, 1852, um, and uh, it became a very good selling book. Uh, it sold 300,000 copies prior to the Civil War, uh, which essentially made it a bestseller. Um, it is, of course, still in print, and you can find it in a variety of uh, publications, or a, a variety of uh, formats uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, this was a very important work uh, in that it uh, formulated the way in which the North thought about slavery. The story is told that uh, Beecher Stowe had the opportunity to meet Abraham Lincoln um, while the Civil War was going on, uh, and allegedly he made the comment to her um, that uh, this is the lady who wrote this little book that started this great war, uh, essentially kind of suggesting that you know Uncle Tom's Cabin led to the Civil War. Well, whether or not Lincoln actually said that, there was a way in which Uncle Tom's Cabin put a human face on slavery for people in the North. Um, many people in the North, by this point, had not really interacted with slaves, um, may not have even interacted many with many African Americans at all. But although Uncle Tom's Cabin was fiction, it did provide a way through its characters and events for people to begin to think about these are real human lives that are the you know that are in the south right the slaves are real human people uh, again kind of makes sense to us today that you know why should somebody have to be told that but um, there's a way in which you know this was a way in which a lot of people thought at the time and the way, the ways that she talked about slaves, though, um, you know, there's some there's some things that are problematic uh, in Awful Tom's Cabin for all of its great purposes to try and work against slavery. It's problematic in some ways, and some of that has to do with the ways uh, in which uh, slaves are presented. Um, you know, they're presented as being naturally religious. Um, you know, as a Christian, I, I think that we're all naturally religious. Um, certainly, there would be those that would disagree with us, uh, disagree with me uh, about that. But the ways in which <clears throat> Beecher Stowe presented slaves, you know, fostered an idea of well, Africans and African Americans are more religious than whites. There's today some sociological backing of that, but you know, there's still a racialized notion of that, right? There, it, it's, it sounds good, but it still assumes certain things about race that probably are not something we want to promote in the sense of, you know, there's a difference between whites and blacks in this way. There's something inherently religious about blacks that whites don't have. But the, the, the slaves in Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, are religious, and even those that aren't, seem to be kind of fighting against their own nature and are easily converted uh, when given the chance. And often it's the idea that because they are experiencing slavery um, and this has opened them to, you know, connecting to God, connecting them to the divine uh, easier. Uncle Tom, <coughs> one of the main characters, uh, in the novel uh, is a Christ figure. Um, it's not a spoiler since the book was 1852, but uh, he dies uh, at the end of the book um, and is kind of beaten for sins uh, and, and beaten in a redemptive way. 
right? dies in a redemptive way, uh, in that his um, his death uh, leads to the conversion of uh, some other characters in the novel. Uh, Uncle Tom, as he's presented in the novel, is a very positive character, or in the sense of he's he's presented as a positive character. Um, but over the past couple decades, um, his representation has become problematic for a lot of African Americans, and so Uncle Tom, as a, a phrase, has been used in more negative uh, ways by a lot of African Americans uh, in more recent decades. But ultimately, he's presented as kind of this Christ figure that is saving whites and blacks in some ways, um, you know, throughout uh, the novel. Um, but despite some of the problematic depictions here, right, this is a white woman attempting to uh, write about slave life when she is not a slaveholder, has not had a lot of interaction. Uh, there are other African Americans who are writing at this time, Martin Delaney, for example, uh, who are you know presenting more accurate depictions of uh, black life. Uh, but you know this this is something that becomes very popular, uh, becomes uh, very known, and does have an impact on on people. The book was written especially. Um, to respond to the Compromise of 1850, which included the Fugitive Slave Law, uh, which was a very problematic piece of legislation. Now, there had been a Fugitive Slave Law um, that had been developed in the 1790s, but it was largely a weak piece of legislation uh, that wasn't uh, as um, upheld and enforced as people in the South wanted. And so in 1850, um, a piece of legislation was passed, an omnibus, that tied in a variety of things, including things like um, California coming in as a free state, um, you know, California, of course, gold had been discovered in California in the 1840s. Enough people had moved there that there was an effort to achieve statehood. Well, so there was that piece of legislation. There were some things about um, territories taken from Mexico in the aftermath of the war with Mexico. Uh, so all these pieces of legislation were the Compromise of 1850. And one piece the South wanted was a stronger fugitive slave law. And particularly, it was that instead of just uh, kind of sitting back and hoping people would return fugitive slaves, it charged federal marshals to be actively on the lookout for runaway slaves in the North, which forced a lot of slaves uh, to you know, go to Canada rather than the North. Right, so as Harriet Tubman and others in using the Underground Railroad, other options were trying to get people uh, out of slavery, they often had to guide them to Canada uh, or maybe some places where uh, the fugitive slave law wasn't going to be as enforced. Um, but as you can see in this uh, advertisement here, um, you know, that people are going to be uh, going after African Americans um, that, you know, essentially it was dependent upon the African American to prove that they weren't a slave. The assumption was you're a runaway slave unless you can prove you're not. And so people who were free um, may have been born free, uh, may have gained their freedom, uh, you know, through paying for it or whatever. Uh, or through uh, some other manner, they could end up back in slavery simply because they weren't able to prove uh, that they were um, free, that they had freedom. Which led, you know, many prominent northern people to speak out against it. For example, a senator from New York uh, named William Seward, who would eventually serve as uh, Secretary of State uh, under... Abraham Lincoln, 
best known as negotiating the sale of Alaska to the United States. Uh, it was referred to as Seward's Folly. Uh, but he spoke, uh, you know, he uh, gave a speech uh, in Congress uh, to the Senate that essentially he was not going to follow the fugitive slave law and, and encourage people in the North not to follow the fugitive slave law, uh, that instead they were required to follow a higher law, uh, you know, essentially kind of the higher law of God. Uh, something was similar with uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was certainly not Orthodox Christian at this time, uh, better known uh, for his transcendentalism, uh, but he too, uh, you know, spoke out against it, well known for his rejection of the fugitive slave law. Uh, Unitarian minister Theodore Parker uh, was also uh, very vocal. Uh, and was, you know, essentially active uh, in some times in disobeying the fugitive slave law, helping, you know, protect individuals, even who, you know, some of whom weren't runaway slaves, some of whom were, uh, you know, helping protect them from, uh, you know, the, you know, store, you know, uh, keeping them in churches and, and other efforts and you know, getting uh, people to protect them from the marshals. Uh, all to try and, uh, you know, resist the fugitive slave law. Another way Christianity was intertwined with the origins of the Civil War is uh, present in the events of the raid on the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, um, led by a man named John Brown, uh, pictured here. We can see some of the... Uh, ways in which uh, this is, you know, Brown was very much tied up with uh, Christianity and the way people thought about his raid. For example, uh, you can take a look at this piece of artwork here of uh, John Brown. Um, you know, very, you know, his arms outstretched, also kind of in a, a cross type um, a formation. Uh, you, of course, see the in the background the the uh, north, south, uh, at the bottom, uh, of course, people, some dying, uh, bodies, etc. So, uh, it gets very t tied up with, uh, Christianity, uh, here in the, the years prior to the Civil War, of course, uh, in his hand is the Bible, uh, with the symbols, the Alpha and the Omega, uh, kind of from the book of Revelation. Uh, John Brown, um, in the 1850s, um, became very interested in freeing slaves. Um, he was inspired by Nat Turner's revolt in the 1830s, um, appropriated some of Turner's methods, but uh, you know he didn't like that that notion of uh, indiscriminate slaughter, uh, of just killing everybody. Um, so, you know, that was one element of, of Turner's that uh, he didn't follow after. In many respects, for Brown, uh, he felt that he too was divinely appointed to end slavery through whatever means necessary, even if it meant violence. And he often connected himself um, and even his followers, some of the people that followed after him, two biblical figures like David, uh, others who were chosen by God for great works, kind of saw himself that way. Um, he even created a strict moral code that was to be this new constitution after the revolt. Like once he um, helped free the slaves, he was going to set up a new government with a new constitution that had these moral components uh, you know, profanity, drunkenness, stealing, uh, other types of moral infractions were to be heavily punished. And so Brown begins to make some plans. Uh, in December of 1858, uh, he uh, led a raid into Missouri, uh, freed somewhere between 10 to 12 slaves, 
and uh, takes them into Canada, frees them, takes them to Canada. So it's kind of like a, a trial run uh, that he uh, helps, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of trying to see, you know, what can I get into these uh, raids to free slaves? So when that's successful, he begins to plan kind of a, a deeper attack and chooses Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Um, it's West Virginia today, but at the time it was Virginia. West Virginia uh, came as a state in the eight, middle of the middle of the Civil War, as the northwest corner of Virginia was more uh, people that supported uh, freedom. They weren't slavery; uh, they were against slavery, and so West Virginia kind of is, is formed as a separate state. But at the time, Harper's Ferry was in Virginia, and um, it is a federal arsenal. So it is a place where the federal government keeps weapons, uh, munitions, other types of supplies. So <clears throat> he gets some support from some leading abolitionists, um, some that are supporting him financially. Uh, they're not really joining the cause as they're going to go out and raid, but they are supporting him financially in, in other ways. So he begins to round up a force. Um, largely it's his sons, sons-in-law, uh, a few others, and so he uh, begins kind of scouting out Harper's Ferry, uh, which is where you know the Shenandoah River, the Potomac River meet there. There's railroads nearby. Um, you know he's raid the arsenal, seize the weapons, establish a fort, use the fort, raid out, seize slaves. Right. So you kind of create this central location. There's railroads there for transportation, water transportation. You know and and, and, you know, start raiding out into these various places. So, in uh, October of 1859, he decides he is ready to strike at the heart of slavery. So, early on October 16th, 1859, Brown has gathered together uh, a force of 22 people uh, including his sons, uh, some free blacks, and they go to the arsenal and they take it. Well, the slaves are too afraid, and so there is no rising up that takes place in response. Um, there, there are people uh, there waiting. Um, well, no, there's there's uh, efforts to try and create an uprising, but it doesn't take place, there's an exchange of fire, uh, news of the raid spreads, and a local militia responds. Other militias respond as well. Um, the force tries to get John Brown to retreat, but he's not, he lingers there, and eventually a force is, shows up that cuts him off from retreat. Uh, he's surrounded, uh, he's put under siege, there's killings that take place on both sides as fires exchanged. Uh, the mayor is shot and killed. Um, so eventually five men remain in the engine house unhurt when the Marines and the Marines arrive. Uh, Robert E. Lee at this time is in command. Um, there is a uh, parlay for surrender. Uh, Jeb Stewart uh, is Lee's man for the parlay. Um, Brown is not going to um, surrender and so Lee uh, decides to go in and his force is captured in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Brown is taken to Charleston, uh, Virginia, uh, tried for uh, treason uh, against Virginia uh, and uh, uh, you know tried for murder uh, as well. The trials delayed uh, but eventually held and he is hanged uh, in the first uh, week of December of 1859. Now, in the aftermath, uh, the the Secret Six, these abolitionists who supported Brown, kind of separate uh, themselves from him. Uh, there's talks of rescue, but Ra Brown refuses uh, to do that before uh, you know there's there, before there's a uh, uh, before his execution. Uh, his uh, last message, so to speak, is that slavery is only going to be rid by bloodshed.
Now, his mission, initial message had been to uh, free the slaves, um, but you know, there's a, there's a feeling among people that the, during the raid, Brown changed his mind. Uh, little planning really took place, and there is uh, a fatalism uh, that is, you know, part of him that like this had to happen this way. He, you know, at some point decides the the cause needs a martyr, and he's going to be that person, and so he refuses rescue, etc. Um, after Brown's death, there's a lot of biblical imagery and symbolism that are attached to his. Uh, you know, railing against slavery. Uh, he is uh, thought of as an avenging angel that is striking out of slavery. Uh, and so poets and musicians and writers make comparisons uh, between Brown. Uh, you know, they, they talk to him, talk about him as, you know, kind of about the uh, exodus. And, and uh, he's kind of this antebellum Moses standing up to the Pharaoh of the South, crying for the freedom of his people. Other people compared him to the crucified Christ, uh, you know, that, that he is, uh, you know, dying for the sins of the people. Uh, certainly they're not saying, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, he is the same place as Christ, but they're, they're using that kind of imagery uh, to talk about um, the, these kind of, you know, what, what role he uh, presents. And essentially he is a martyr for slavery. Um, you know that that this is um, that this is a religious event and religious individual, not just um, you know a political um, you know insurrectionist. <clears throat> when we come to thinking about so you know these these kind of things show us the intertwining of. Christianity, the foundations for the Civil War, the origins of the Civil War. Um, in during the Civil War, we see the similar types of um, <clears throat> intertwining. You know, both the uh, Union and the Confederacy looked upon what they were doing as being justified by God. That uh, you know, God was behind them. Whether they were fighting for slavery or fighting against slavery, they claimed that God was behind them and appealed to scriptures, theology, to justify that. Both sides prayed uh, for God's blessing, you know, prayed that God would support their cause, that God would uh, benefit them, that they would be um, ultimately victorious uh, through help, through his help. And, you know, both sides also... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, both sides also saw their cause as a sacred cause. It wasn't just a political cause. It wasn't just um, maybe uh, the appropriate thing to do. It was a sacred cause, and so they they endeavored to do these things to to please God, to do what they believed that that God wanted them to do. And as they talked about the war, <clears throat> they talked about it using scriptural language. Uh, they, they justified things through uh, scripture, right? You know, the ideas of a higher law and, uh, you know, other types of language that was used from the Bible to understand what was being done. Uh, there was a lot of uh, ways in which uh, this was understood in kind of a millennial uh, type of way, right? These are the preparations for uh, the uh, the next age. <clears throat> Some of which uh, you might be able to see. Uh, this this picture is so detailed, you might not be able to pick out uh, everything uh, in it. But you know, there's that millennial type of context, right? The heavens opening. Um, you know, here we have uh, you know King Cotton. Uh, down here in the uh, the lower uh, right hand corner, who is uh, you know this kind of uh, uh, alligator headed king whose body is a sack of cotton, um, and you know he's this terrible monster sitting on his throne. Uh, you know the, this column uh, behind him is on fire. Uh, it has the words Lecompton 
uh, which is a constitution that was passed in Kansas in 1857. Uh, it says fugitive slave, Missouri Compromise. Uh, all of these are, are burning uh, around him. Uh, of course, he's got a slave uh, there as well, but the slave's looking upwards toward uh, you know, what we see in the, cl the clouds. Here, freedom, uh, wearing an Indian bonnet, so it's kind of uh, connected with Native Americans, holding a liberty cap uh, connected with the Revolutionary War, uh, appears with a uh, large American flag, all sorts of people around him. There's um, Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, um, images of Jesus on the one hand, uh, the goddess Justice on the right, and there is uh, the goddess Humanitas, um, born by an eagle, holding an infant, reaching down to the slave below. Uh, the eagle is uh, clutching uh, the, the cloak of King Cotton, uh, while also having several lightning bolts, uh, which is where the, uh, the, the fire has uh, come from. Uh, there's the Hydra of Discord there uh, in this shadowy uh, background, uh, accompanied by uh, a dog that is a fugitive slave law. There's overseers, uh, you know, a, sh a ship coming to shore, bringing uh, a variety of slaves from a, you know, a ship uh, visible in the distance. Um, and, and so, you know, th this is kind of a mixture of pagan symbolism, uh, Christian symbolism, uh, other types of symbolic types of things, uh, symbolism, but <clears throat> essentially what we have here is, you know, this, this notion of this is not just a political event. There is greater religious significance to this and what is taking place uh, that uh, needs to be uh, understood. Um, Lincoln, uh, as he talked about the war, uh, frequently talked about, uh, you know, God's providence, uh, not understanding what God was doing. Um, Lincoln, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Lincoln's religion here a little bit more uh, in, in a minute, but he is thinking through this in very religious types of ways and using a lot of religious language, uh, much of it Christian, uh, some of it Old Testament, uh, some of it New Testament. But all of that is, you know, being used to think about what is taking place. And that reflects, you know, the, that what is taking place in the ways that people are trying to work out their understanding of uh, the war, right? In the North, um, saving the Union was a divine purpose. It's not just a political event, but there's something divine, right? God wants the Union uh, to remain whole. And so there is a need for, you know, pushing for this, uh, this Union. Um, often, uh, for a lot of religious people, there is a pushing against uh, slavery, the South, uh, by um, preachers, by others, uh, you know, using religious language to denounce what is taking place in the South, to condemn slavery, uh, to look at it as anti-Christian, to look at the people of the South uh, as anti-Christian uh, as well. Additionally, in the North, you know, there were days of fasting, uh, if a particular battle was lost, then religious leaders, uh, re well, religious leaders or political leaders in the North, federal government, state government, uh, would call for people to fast, right? Perhaps they had done something that had displeased God, and so they are fasting to repent and gain God's favor. If something goes well, they are holding days of thanksgiving to God and, and thanking God for what has taken place. Uh, in the South, God is justifying the separate Southern nation, right? as we talked about with uh, religion and Southern separatism. Right? It's a divine purpose to secede from the Union, uh, that, that this was what God wanted in order for the people to remain faithful. Uh, and just like the North, uh, they are engaging in uh, days of fasting, days of thanksgiving. Right. 
So both sides here are intertwining Christianity with their endeavors. Christianity was also an important part of the army uh, as well. Uh, there were revivals and camp meetings uh, that took place um, near the army. Right? People would establish these camp meetings. Uh, there were revivals that took place among the ar uh, among the soldiers in the army. You know, there are a lot of efforts that, as you know, as these armies or as these regiments would pass through towns. Uh, you know, there there would be efforts to go out and meet them. Uh, preachers go out and, and preach to them. Uh, you know, holding these revivals. Uh, there were chaplains uh, that were involved uh, in the uh, the ministering to the soldiers in the army. Uh, you know, attempting to uh, you know provide some religious help and understanding during these times. Uh, you know, local preachers uh, would would hold uh, meetings, uh, would hold religious services uh, for people. <clears throat> Excuse me. People back home would uh, send Bibles and tracts to the soldiers uh, to try and help them, uh, you know, uh, keep their religious commitment uh, or you know try and encourage them, uh, you know, in their religious knowledge. Uh, we can see it uh, also in uh, the ways in which uh, women uh, were active. Uh, with respect to the war, uh, being involved in a variety of relief organizations. Remember, a lot of Christians, you know, looked to, to uh, reform institutions to carry out their Christianity as a part of carrying out their Christianity. And so a lot of women during the Civil War were involved in relief organizations, helping uh, people, widows, orphans, uh, other types of uh, needs in various places. Uh, either during or after the various battles or as at, d during or after the, uh, the, the armies went through, nearly all of them connected to Christianity to some extent. And so the <clears throat> religious connection that women had, right? You know, a lot of the uh, ways we talk about feminine religion a feminine Christianity in the 19th century is sentiment, uh, sentimentality. Right? That there's this emotionalism, uh, you, you know, like in something like uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and elsewhere, uh, looking, uh, you know, through nostalgia, uh, feelings of compassion and pity. Well, that was put to use for this kind of religious zeal for helping people. Uh, for upholding moral guidelines, encouraging morality. Um, all of that was ways in which women became very active uh, in these war times. Um, the, you know, they were angels of mercy. They were nurses. Uh, they were, uh, you know, other types of, you know, teachers, other types of uh, responsibilities that they took on uh, to... Uh, endeavor to to help uh, people out, uh, help soldiers, uh, help families at home, uh, etc. You know, as we think about, we kind of touched on this a little bit already, uh, but there was very much a consistent idea across the United States for a lot of people that God was approving this war. Now certainly there were differences, right? You know, in the North God wore blue, in the South God wore gray, but he approved of what was taking place. That God sanctioned it, uh, that God uh, had kind of pushed people towards this, uh, but people saw the war as God's purging of the country. Uh, he was going to get rid of something, and of course that something depended upon whether you were uh, north or south. Others saw the war as God's judgment, right? that, that God was withholding his approval from a particular group, or God was using uh, a particular group 
uh, to bring about judgment. And all of this uh, is President Abraham Lincoln trying to figure out uh, what is uh, what this means, uh, what he's supposed to do, and how uh, you know how this fits into his understanding of God. And I think we see this uh, somewhat in uh, you know uh, Lincoln's own personal views. This uh, photograph was taken in March fourth. 1865 at Lincoln's second inauguration. Um, it had rained that day. Uh, there were about 30 to 40,000 uh, people that had gathered uh, for uh, this, uh, this inauguration. It was the first time in 32 years for a second term uh, inauguration. There had been a lot of first term or one-term presidents prior to this point. Now, the sun began to shine shortly before um, Lincoln uh, spoke. Uh, about noon, he uh, traveled to the Capitol. He is the first president uh, to see the new dome on the Capitol. It's not new to us, but at the time, uh, it was new to him. And uh, gave his inaugural speech. Uh, this picture is the only time uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, was photographed giving a speech. It's kind of difficult to pick him out, but he is in the center uh, there. Let's see if we can uh, highlight him here. All right, this is Lincoln right in here. The speech is 700 words, 701 words long. It is 25 sentences and four paragraphs. It's the second shortest inaugural address in history. Uh, I want to take the time to read it because I think it does kind of show the ways in which Lincoln is, is working uh, through uh, some of this uh, ideology and some of this um, trying to connect religion and uh, uh, his understanding of the Civil War. <clears throat> Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and grosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted to altogether to saving the Union without war, urgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would, would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish, and the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, 
Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein <clears throat> any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, it's God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The speech reflects um, how <clears throat> ambiguous Lincoln's religion really was. Certainly he quotes here in his uh, inaugural from the New Testament, uh, from Jesus. He also quotes from uh, the Psalms. But Lincoln didn't really, um, you know, ever join a specific religious group. Uh, he didn't talk much about Christ, although he talked uh, a lot about God. Um, so, you know, we're not really sure exactly uh, how he fit, how, you know, how he fit into the religious time. And so a lot of books have been written about Lincoln's religion, a variety of claims about Lincoln's religion. He has some of that civil religion idea, you know, the importance of the country, the connection between the country and God, but he also has, um, you know, he has... Uh, he doesn't fully adopt it, right? He refers to the United States, not in this uh, speech, but in other places, as the almost chosen people, right? They're not the chosen people. They're the almost chosen people. So there's some civil religious aspect to it, but, but not quite. He was uh, very fatalistic. Um, you know, what's going to come is going to come. Uh, we'll accept what God gives us. Um, and, you know, throughout uh, a lot of his private reflections, even some of his public speeches, he's trying to figure out what God is doing. He doesn't understand what God's doing. He believes God's doing something, but he's not entirely sure what all that means. After uh, his death, and some points, uh, you know, even during his life, all sorts of people uh, wanted to claim him. All sorts of groups claimed, uh, you know, that he was a part of their particular denomination. He had converted to their particular church. Um, it doesn't seem like Lincoln himself ever really affiliated with a specific church. Um, grew up Baptist or was born into a Baptist family, but doesn't seem to really have uh, been that much a part of uh, the Baptists or any other group that claimed him. But uh, his religious vision uh, did resonate with uh, a lot of people. Uh, and, and so, you know, that I think is uh, an important aspect of all this. And, you know, really, he does become an American saint. Um, he is shot uh, on... Uh, Good Friday in 1865, um, and so that, you know, kind of further cements his sainthood 
um, dies uh, shortly after uh, he is shot. Um, you know, so he's kind of a martyr for his cause. So he does uh, kind of, um, you know, reflect this, um, you know, American sainthood. Uh, you know, he's, he's uh, now more recently, you know, people started to question some of the things about Lincoln and some of the attitudes he has, uh, but he's still, you know, pretty well considered um, one of the, uh, the uh, important figures. As we finish talking about the Civil War, I want to talk, I want to finish uh, up by talking about uh, an element of the aftermath of the Civil War as the South endeavored to try and understand what had happened and where they should move now. Uh, and this uh, development is referred to as the Lost Cause. The Lost Cause is essentially you know, a, a way in which the South endeavors to try and reaffirm its Southern identity in the face of defeat, right? The South loses, and so here they were thinking about, okay, we're more godly than the North, we're more Christian than the North, why did we lose? Uh, and so it's, it's these efforts to try and overcome history, right? To try and make sense of Southern identity uh, and and move on from that. I think a good example of this uh, is um, prevalent in this uh, part of a sermon here uh, from a man, a uh, preacher named Melville Jackson, who said, In standing here this day, I charge the historian of these times that he shall not fail to tell to future ages that the southern soldier was a Christian warrior uh, and that he was brace, he was irresistible, because his faith was in God and in the justice of his cause. Right? So it's <clears throat> even though the South the Civil War was fought from the perspective of the South to maintain the right to hold people in bondage, there is an effort to say this was a Christian endeavor and that the people involved in this were Christian people. <clears throat> And so, you know, there's this idea of, you know, the old South was a South of, of order, of, of moral uh, virtue, um, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, it's, it was chivalry and all these other kind of things, and, and ignore the violence, ignore uh, the oppression the ways in which people took advantage of each other. I mean, slavery was held in check by violence. Uh, slavery, uh, slave women were frequently raped, sometimes by Southern owners that sat in the same church as they did on Sunday mornings. Right? We cannot overlook that. And so we have to be careful because this religion of the lost cause still has power even today in people thinking about um, a variety of political events um, and, and, and other types of um, issues that we face with, with race, with politics, uh, with Civil War monuments. You know, all of this is um, wrapped up in this lost cause. What are some of the components of uh, this lost cause? Well, there is the the pantheon of Southern heroes. Uh, Lee, Jackson, Jefferson Davis, right? the highest products of the South, the, the, the highest moral examples, the best of Christian and Southern values. Again, this is problematic. These are people that fought to hold other people in bondage. Um, you know, so we have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap that people are trying to set for us about who these people were and what they were involved in. But you have this pantheon of Southern heroes. You have the myth of the Old South that was all about gentility uh, Mag Moonlight and Magnolias, Chivalry, Honor. 
The lost cause also tended to emphasize uh, suffering. Right, the Civil War was a holy war. Uh, Christ's suffering is compared to Confederate suffering, uh, and so you know there's there's a way in which people think about the you know the the South losing in very holy types of ways. That ultimately the Confederates were more Christian than the Yankees. Now, in a sense, you know, there's some, uh, there's some, you know, truthfulness to this in the sense that sociologically, more people might have connected with uh, religious, uh, you know, religious groups in the South than the North, but, you know, other ways that becomes problematic. So here you have the components of the religion of the lost cause. Right? You have the Southern heroes, the myth of the Old South, the suffering and salvation wrapped up with Jesus' suffering and salvation, and this notion of Christian identity. And through all of this, these images that pervade, the, I mean, even today there are groups that still hold on to these images. That in itself wouldn't have been so significant, but over time, a variety of rituals and institutionalizing made this lost cause such a vital part of the South um, through religious commemoration, through sermons, extolling Southern heroes as saints and martyrs, uh, you know, pointing to uh, them and, and preaching about them, the best of Confederate uh, Christian and Southern uh, values and and not just in regular sermons, but these times uh, celebrating the Confederacy, commemorating them, um, you know, talking about them in these very positive ways, making them an actual part of churches through stained glass windows. Now, this stained glass window uh, here is from the, uh, the National Cathedral, uh, but you can see, you know, Robert E. Lee, uh, I'm guessing that's Stonewall Jackson uh, on the, uh, the in the stained glass. Uh, you know, so you have in in some church buildings uh, the scenes from the Bible in stained glass, along with um, stained glass windows of uh, of Confederate heroes. The creation or the veneration of a variety of uh, sacred relics, right? Bibles used by Confederates get this aura of sacredness, uh, coats, flags, weapons uh, used by these individuals, um, you know, being honored and, and respected. Uh, even showing up in hymns, uh, you know, there would be uh, use of, of hymns when Confederates, veterans would gather, uh, you know, part of it would be Religious, you know, there'd be the singing of hymns. Um, some of the hymns would eventually be changed, and hymns uh, about some of the leaders. So, for example, uh, a, a verse of when the roll is called up yonder that was used, that was created, uh, included this On that mistless, lonely morning, when the saved of Christ shall rise, in the Father's many mansioned home to share. Where are Lee and Jackson call us to their home beyond the skies when the roll is called up yonder, let's be there. Right? So, you know, kind of Lee and Jackson are going to be waiting for us um, in heaven and they're going to be calling us to heaven. Um, the funerals of soldiers were another way, funerals of Confederate soldiers were another way that the lost cause became a very important uh, part. You know, funerals were held in dress grays. Uh, they were military, sim uh, they were military, um, military ceremonies. Uh, there was actually a, uh, uh, a Confederate veterans burial ritual uh, that was developed, uh, talking about them going to uh, an honorable grave. They had fought the good fight and the Confederates were noble and virtuous people. And then finally, uh, you know, there's a variety of uh, monuments and shrines that are created. Uh, 
by 1914, over a thousand monuments bat uh, were created. Battlefields were seen as uh, pilgrimage sites. There were statues uh, with religious phrases like our cause is with God. There were shrines on battlefields uh, and various things, etc. And I think it's important to note in uh, the conflict over Confederate monuments, Confederate statues, that a majority of these statues did not appear right after the Civil War. Um, and part of that had to do with Reconstruction. Right, right after the Civil War, there is such a heavy federal government presence in the South to pre preserve African American civil rights uh, that there aren't these creations to honor the, the Confederacy like monuments. Uh, and it's only after the Compromise of 1876, which essentially removed federal presence in the South and ended Reconstruction, that the South erected these monuments of white supremacy to justify their rejection of African American civil rights and all the things that take place after that, and you know, ignoring a variety of amendments to the Constitution. And so the first round of these monuments happen, right, as African Americans are, you know, had been asserting their rights, and now those rights are being uh, suppressed. The second round occurs after Brown v. Board of Education, which integrated schools. So, you know, these lost cause monuments uh, are monuments to white supremacy as much as we might not like it. And we might want to think, oh, it's about heritage. No, it, these were used to try to put and keep African Americans in a certain place, in a place of uh, second class citizenship. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is very problematic. So you have these rituals surrounded by, you know, surrounding this core of, uh, you know, the religion of the lost cause, but it becomes institutionalized and really it comes a part of the South um, through a variety of ways. One of those is uh, a variety of uh, Confederate veterans groups, like the United Confederate Veterans, uh, and then being passed down to other groups, uh, like the Sons of the Confederate uh, Veterans, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, and with that, there's a lot of sacred rhetoric that's used about the group, about the South, uh, beginning reunions with prayers, uh, saying we're gathered in the sight of God, right? All of these things are part of these uh, veterans groups, of these heritage groups. Uh, again, and, and I'm not saying that that all of these people are are necessarily uh, white supremacists, but you know, this this is a, a part in which white supremacy has been uh, perpetuated in our culture because of not recognizing, uh, you know, this this lost cause. Uh, Southern churches participated in this proliferation and institution of the lost cause. Um, you know, the, the Southern heroes were Christians. Uh, the God of the lost cause was the biblical God. Churches were used for Confederate observances, memorials, funerals, fundraising for monuments. Right? So churches are intertwined in this as well. Uh, the schools in the South were intertwined as well. Uh, Confederate veterans and widows dominated as teachers, principals, other uh, education uh, edu uh, educators at the time. Um, they taught Southern traditions, taught the lost cause, used pro-Southern textbooks. Uh, and then of course as uh, various uh, private religious academies developed, these things were taught there as well. So Christianity uh, in various forms were, was tied up with uh, the beginnings, the, the carrying out, and the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, in some ways it might be positive, some ways uh, quite visibly negative, um, and just another part of uh, the ways in which Christianity is tied up with the culture of the United States. Uh, that it's while we might say Christianity should be above culture and separate from culture, often it is very intertwined with culture 
in in various ways and and again you north and south here right? they're 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 approaching christianity in different ways but both of them believe that what they're doing is christian and so uh, that brings us to the end of the civil war period we'll move on from this period to talk more about some things that took place in the later part of the 19th century in a later session.